because again, the purchasing people say, why do we have to worry about customs issues or trade issues? Because if you don't know where your product is coming from, if you don't know where it's actually made, you're not going to get it across the border. It's not going to be allowed importation into the United States. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. Hey, Lalo, it's uh, good to be back. It's uh, starting out a, a, a whole new year, so it's uh, going to be exciting and uh, got through the holidays and uh, as anybody would do is probably looking at trying to do uh, new year's resolution and uh, you know, lose weight, stop smoking. <laughs> if you're smoking try you know, uh, exercise, all that kind of stuff and, and whatnot. So how are you doing, bud? We're doing good. Thank you. Yeah. And happy new year to you too. So um, yeah, everything hopefully uh, last year picked up really nicely um, in spite of, of course, you know, um, the near recession or, or, well, I always say we were in a recession, but anyway, you know, but, uh, things went semi good, you know, a lot better than, than, uh, the COVID years. Right. I mean, those were, right. you know, we, we oh. got back out and we did conferences and, uh, you know, ICPA was seemed to have been good, you know, looking forward to this one coming up in March and, uh, you know, that it, it's, it'll be a bigger one or their big one. So yeah, you know, it, it's, it's just um, hopefully 2023 seems to be looking a lot better. Well, I'm, uh, you know, we <clears throat> have some legacy things that are going on. We're going to get to talk to some folks, a couple of folks today for our listeners. First off, before I say anything else, again, thank you for what you've uh, done for us in 2022. Um, I, I, again, I, Lalo uh, has the statistics. He, he knows all this stuff. And I got to tell you, <laughs> I am always shocked when I hear we're trending well in Europe and, and actually you told me the last time we talked was in Saudi Arabia of all places. Yeah. Um, and yet we're a U.S. centric type uh, show, but it's like, uh, again, to our listeners and everybody else, thank you for sharing and downloading and, and liking us or whatever you're doing. And we really appreciate you. Um, that said, we're going to be talking about what did we learn from 2022 as well as what's the future hold for 2023 that we can look at. We've got a new Congress coming in. We've got, uh, you know, the past of uh, turmoil. We've got Southern border issues is going on. Uh, there's regulations, there's legacy regulations, different policies, different administrations, different things going on. So all said and done, um, again, we've, We've had one of our guests on here before, and I have been looking forward to having our our second one. So, uh, uh, Lala, do you want to introduce him? You want me to? Sure. Well, I mean, everybody knows Adrian, Adrian Brown Miller. She's uh, she's uh, been on our show before, and of course, uh, I'm pretty sure our listeners, um, because of the circles that we run around, I mean, she's she's very active in the community, and uh, alongside with her, it's rare that you will see a webinar <laughs> without these two presenting so george tuttle you know and uh, both of them are attorneys uh, one is from uh san francisco and or the bay area and uh, adrian is in the dallas area but um yeah i mean I, i've we've known them for quite a long time and and again we see them in the circuit and uh, in the very active in the community which is really nice to see you know and so i'm pretty sure even if um they don't you know i'm pretty sure everyone's seen them around uh, in one way or another oh. Uh, good night. And it's like, well, welcome, Adrian and George. And I, I'll say uh, to both of you, you're not only you're good friends, but uh, Lalo and I both have a tremendous amount of respect for both. Of exactly. Y'all. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Annie, Lalo, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. So. All right. So, well, let me, let's jump in here. Um, as far as now, everybody, you know, we're going to have links to y'all's bios and everything else. Right. My goodness. If we start reading your bios and your backgrounds, you know, basically bottom line folks, these are two of 
very experienced customs attorneys that have a tremendous amount of experience in dealing with regulations, helping people, you know, when they step into it, these are the folks that can help get you out of trouble or minimize the risk and all that. So anyway, all that to say, just like what I was saying, it's like, okay, what do you think from y'all's perspective is uh, some of the best uh, lessons we may have learned good or bad from 2022? You want me to start, to George? Yeah. Ladies first, okay. always. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lord. he's over here. See, George George is trying to think through this a little bit. Oh, man, I got to think through okay. this. <laughs> he's good, and he's good at thinking. He's good at oh, thinking. This, is, this is earlier for me than you, right? <laughs> no. uh, and I know that you didn't have, I don't know if you had coffee, but anyway. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost yeah. there. <laughs> it's really interesting. Lessons learned. I mean, Part of part of the thing I think about, which is kind of obvious from some of the legislation and, and developments that we saw in 2022 is trying to avoid doing business with Russia and and the yes. continued decoupling right. of China. Um, so I think both of those, obviously the focus on national security and trying to avoid, uh, dealing with anyone involved in, uh, commercial military fusion like China is right. Where they're taking commercial items and, and basically morphing them into a military, uh, item. Um, I definitely think that will continue onward in 23. I don't think you're going to see a lot of um, softening of our position on China. Um, if anything, maybe it might it might be worse. I don't know. That's really hard because I'm guessing. I don't really know what you know what the future holds. I do know that there's a lot of concern about the semiconductor rule that. Uh, was issued uh, late last year. Um, and I think a lot of it is, I thought there was a very interesting presentation that um, an official from the Semiconductor Industry Association gave at one of the TAC meetings I attended earlier this week. And he showed um, how, how much harm will be done to the U.S. semiconductor base by the semiconductor rule and and the fact that it's also um, a unilateral control that none of our trading partners have joined us uh, in against China yet. Um, it's kind of like when you look at Russia, we went after Russia first and then we were like, oh, please let our allies join us in this uh, and all the prohibitions and sanctions we're, we're placing on Russia. It's the same thing with the semiconductor rule, uh, advanced uh, computing rule. Right now, it's a unilateral control, which makes it really hard for uh, a lot of multinationals to figure out how to navigate. Um, and it also has a, an impact on, it, this is crazy, it also has an impact on non-EAR items. Um, and at, where there are activities by U.S. persons certain activities that are prohibited by us persons. So that that's kind of confusing. Well, um, and uh, just for, let's stop for a minute, just for those that may sure. not be aware of the rule, the rule <clears throat> from semi uh, on the semiconductors is that none of the components are to be manufactured from a China origin, correct? And, and, yeah, but it's, it's a lot broader than that because it also, right. uh, looks at advanced computing and, and artificial intelligence. And right. there's a laundry list of novel controls that have been put in place. Uh, right. or basically it's an interim final rule. So, so there's a lot, it's very complex. And I think there's a lot of confusion about how the rule applies to a lot of different uh, activities and situations. And, and I know that the government's planning on putting out more frequently asked questions to provide guidance, but there isn't an open comment period right now. And I know companies that are in this space are planning on commenting. And a lot of those mm -hmm. comments are, are being um, 
posed in a way that it's really a question. You know what I mean? Trying to understand how does this work? How does this complex rule apply to us? So, so I think that the issue is that um, the semiconductor rule is more is a broader uh, non excuse me, extraterritorial, it's a broader extraterritorial yeah. type of law than we've ever had in the past, and it's unilateral. So because of that, it can really harm the U.S. The US uh, base. Go ahead. It, right. it, it, it impacts many EAR products. Absolutely. Um, not EAR 99 products. Yes, which is so what it's I'm not, to say. and even non-EAR, yeah. right? Yeah, and and the ability to to re-export those if those products touch any manufacturing facility in China, and then for its re-export, it, it's awfully strange the way it's written, um, and so I think it not only impacts all levels of entities that are involved in semiconductor manufacturing, not just supercomputers, not just artificial intelligence. It's it, has a much broader impact. Uh, yeah. I was doing some work for a company that that you know was basically making polishing compounds for semiconductor wafers, mm -hmm. and when we peeled this thing apart, it affected them it, right. because they had a joint venture in China, and they fell squarely within the rule. Right, uh, and you know they were just shocked. Um, now they had a joint venture and the, and the rules, there's some uh, general license availability, good for six months. If you're, if you have a, uh, an entity in China, but you're wholly owned or operated outside of China. So there are some implications to the rule. Right. Uh, and then, and then the other thing that just moving to the import side, some of the lessons learned, right. And I think George and I can probably speak to this which is the forced labor, the focus on forced labor. Is I, was, I was wondering if yeah. you were going to go there next. Yes. Oh, God, yes. You, you have to go there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. huge. So, it, the impact so it, is, is unreal. It's a, there's a huge impact. And so, but I think the, the shocking part that I was going to say, Andy, is that there's a lot of companies that still don't really understand that this applies to them. Right. Okay. Yeah. There are, there are several companies that haven't done a whole lot of preparation to deal with uh, the Weir Forced Labor Pre Prevention Act um, or like dealing with forced labor concerns in general. Um, so I think, I think you'll see in 2023 more enforcement in this arena, although I will say it has been very measured to date. Um, I, I think on you, Flippa, maybe you'll, we'll see more enforcement. Hey everyone, we're getting ready for another annual ICPA event coming up the week of March 12th in Orlando, Florida. If you have been thinking of attending any of the ICPA conferences, this is the one you should not miss. There will be more sessions than any other conference with a guaranteed sell-up, so hurry and get your tickets today. We are also excited to share that Simply Trade podcast will be in the attendance and we want you to be part of our show. Listen to episodes 14, 15, and 16 to find out why you can't miss this conference. And um, I, I think I think it's one of those situations where companies are really going to have to find what kind of tools and softwares are out there to help make this easier to navigate because of how how broad the 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 supply chain tracing needs to be in order to satisfy customs that there's no forced labor. Well, not only how broad it is, but how mm -hmm. deep you have to go to right. verify and validate that there is not Absolutely. forced labor in that. And that is that difficult. Is. So there was, supposedly there was a, st a statistic that was published just the other day. Sorry, I still need my coffee. <laughs> you go um, right ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, the, Sorry if I don't have the actual number, but this was no. by a spokesman allegedly from Customs. Uh, did you hear? Were you on the call yesterday, Adrian? I wasn't on with, the call. Oh, I, 
I'm, I think I know where you're going. I, I was looking at the AAPI so, info. Yeah, yeah. And there was the spokesman from Customs said, um, and I, it was a very small window of time. I think it was a quarter. Uh, there was like 2,000 shipments that were detained under you flip up alone. Okay. And 300 of them were allowed into the U.S. Wow. So UFLIPA is uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention yeah. Act. Um, is a little bit different than the WROs because it applies uh, a presumption. Mm -hmm. And the presumption is everything from this particular region in China is made using forced labor. And then once that presumption applies, then it flips to the importer to, uh, you know, kind of disprove the negative yeah. in a sense. And um, it applies not only to the goods, but the materials from which the good is made. Um, and so it's a very, very, very difficult to uh, presumption to overcome. So I wanted to back up and just on a broader scale, I think, you know, in terms of lessons learned um, from 2022, I think it, it has to be diversity of our supply chain as, as importers, as manufacturers. We can't rely on single source locations anymore. It's not just our relationship with China, although that co colors everything at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but China has moved so much manufacturing to Southeast Asia, to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to Vietnam, Vietnam. Uh, to all sorts of the surrounding countries, right? But it's still made with Chinese components. So, or, or we're dealing with evasion and diversion and anti-dumping. And so what we're really talking about, the lesson learned for importers is you really can't be oblivious to where your products come from. Absolutely. Because oh, yeah. you are going to get, at some point, there's a massive risk out there for you. And I've had to deal with it, unfortunately, in evasion cases yeah. where the importer says, well, I bought it from this third country. They told me this is where it came from. What am I to do when he's facing an evasion charge from U.S. Customs and millions of dollars of potential duty um, or the complete exclusion of the product under a forced labor uh, prevention act? So I think and, and so bringing that forward into today's time, 2023, that's not changing. I don't see yeah. any real change in this administration's approach to trade. I think there's going to be some softening, right, Adrian? Yeah. When we're talking about, you know, the UK, maybe right. Europe. Right. They'll, there you could be some free trade agreements, right? There could there, Yeah. 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 But in terms with the big picture items, um, China, anti-dumping, uh, country of origin, mm -hmm. you know, country of origin is incredibly difficult to figure out based on today's rules. Um, and depends on whether you're doing a normal substantial transformation test, whether you're doing a double substantial transformation test, whether you're using a free trade agreement substantial yeah. transformation test. Right. So you have to be aware of and know what's mm -hmm. happening. And that, that has to you know, be the same sense when we're dealing with Section 301. Yeah. And you know what? Really Oh, go ahead, George. Go ahead. No, no. I talked enough. Go ahead. No, no. Please. I was just going to say. I was just going to say. Please. I, that that was a brilliant um, point that you made about understanding the rules of origin, uh, the type of rule that would apply to your particular transaction, because um, I have seen uh, in, in a case that I inherited, the lawyer applied a substantial transformation rule when it was really a USMCA marking rule yeah. that should have been applied. So, so not understanding the rules of the road is, you know, importers can you know, do that too. It would be really easy for a non-lawyer to misunderstand which rule of origin applies or what country of origin rules apply. Well, the perfect example of that, right, yeah. is uh, all of our related business out of Mexico, right? Right. Uh, if you look at, what did I see? I saw another set of numbers, which was really incredible. Um, you know, Mexico um, is now like the number one trading partner with the U.S. In other words, we have decoupled from China so Gone far that China is no longer the num number one exporting trading partner to yeah. the U.S., right. which was the idea, right? 
Um, so that, that's been successful, but many companies have been using um, Mexico as, yes. as a new labor platform. Right. However, what they don't realize is that many of the components are still coming from China. <laughs> and those yeah. components are being incorporated into products or finished in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, finished in Mexico. In Mexico. They still retain their Chinese origin. Right. Yeah. And they have to pay Section 301 duties on the item, even if it's otherwise uh, considered to be USMCA origin. Right. So it's a big issue. Um, and, and companies are really, they're not on the mark yet. Mm -mm. They haven't realized this. Well, yeah, right, that's, so here, that's I, well, oh, go ahead. well, I was well, just going to say, it's like, we've talked about quite a few things so far. So I wanted to just stop for a second because we can keep going. I, I'm telling you, and there's a lot here and we're going to keep oh, it's going. Just rules. Yeah, now I'm yeah. awake. Now I'm yeah, awake. There, there <laughs> like, here he goes. Um, and so here's, here's what I would like is that the executives of companies is in reaching out and talking with them for a second is that as if as they're listening it's like okay so there's all this deep discussion china forced labor uh prevention act the uyghur forced labor prevention act the chips uh, act the, the the ruling on the on the semiconductors the the you know thinking that you're okay, you're going to source everything from the U S if you will. And then you turn around and go, you got to dig a little deeper and then you got, well, we're going to source out of Mexico. That's fine. And then you just, George very astutely put the, you know, there are components in there. You got to, you know, look at that. All of that to say is with the executives in there, they're going to need to say, and Adrian, you touched on it, but let's talk just a hair on that. And then we'll come back to some of the more of these issues is the executives and I'm talking the C-suite uh, and or upper middle management should be looking at beefing up their compliance areas. Whereas in the past, and quite frankly, it happened under the Trump administration, there were so many changes happening so quickly that compliance folks found themselves pulled into the table at the C-suite levels going, work with us. Did talk you to see us, what's under going the on. table? <laughs> <laughs> or getting run over there, you know. Yeah. But now what I see is, you know, things have kind of calmed down as far as the amount of change going so rapidly to now more of the actual legislation is going through and the enforcement activities. There's the key is that there's still activities going on. A lot of reg regulations and laws coming in. So would you agree that they need to beef up their compliance and more specifically looking at expanding resources so that some of these compliance people need to get out of their office and go literally go see what's going on? I would. Let me make an observation and then I think Adrian can, can take it from there. One of the things that I have realized over 37, 38 years of this practice is that many in the C-suite have begun to realize that their initial view of the world and world trade was that we were a world without barriers. You could move things from one country to another country and there was no real financial consequence to it. You know, it was like we didn't have a barrier in between us. Um, and so the idea of customs and trade issues and compliance um, wasn't there. Mm -hmm. it, it was like, it's paperwork. Who worries about paperwork? We have, we have people that know how to make up paper and file paper. And what we're seeing today, what we're seeing 2000, uh, 2022, and we'll see it continue in 2023, is this is real live trade issues. There's real barriers to trade and countries are looking at how to imp strengthen those barriers. And that means compliance issues. If you want to keep your company moving, you're going to have to deal with those compliance issues. And many companies are still unprepared to deal with those compliance issues. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, that's what I think that, deal with. I think, yeah, that that's perfect, George. It's just, it's one of those unfortunate uh, investments that they they really need to make that they'll find is important to the longevity of the company because 
because enforcement has been as high as it has been in, in recent years, and I think will continue, I think that the, the C-suite understands better that they need to make this investment. Do all of them understand? No, they don't. But I would just say that because the penalties are higher than they've ever been, that will get their attention. And the prevention of you know multi-million dollar penalties is, is certainly something that I think lends itself towards uh, bolstering yeah, I, the compliance program they have, right? I've seen this more and more in the past year. Companies are getting tagged for a million dollars in back duties that oh, they owe, yeah. and the penalties are two times that. Mm -hmm. They can't, there's no way that they can pay those. And so what happens is, you know, either they're going into chapter 11 bankruptcy, they're closing their doors. Customs doesn't mitigate these things. Um, and, and so there's real problems if you don't have a system in place to, to recognize. This. Well, yeah, especially with the evasion cases, right? Yeah. The right, evasion cases, you know, the government went after a lot of uh, mom and pops and I think the vast majority of them couldn't afford to pay the, the, the duties, the, the anti-dumping duties involved. And, and many of them legitimately thought they were purchasing, like we'll take quartz countertops, that they were legitimately mm -hmm. purchasing quartz countertops from Malaysia right. that were Malaysian origin. They had certificates of origin from Malaysia uh, commerce or ministry. Well, those are worth nothing. And, and, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate, but, but, but absolutely. I think that's one thing that we saw in 2022 was a lot of activity in the evasion arena. And the fact that, that going back to country of origin, a lot of companies and individuals do not know the actual country of origin of the item they're buying and the impact right. it has on the bottom line. Right. Which right. comes back to the vetting process. If you're small mom and pop, a lot of people don't have the, the resources on some of that. And they think they can just, oh, let me <laughs> just source it here and I'm fine. But in reality, there's a scenario there, especially, again, these larger companies. Um, the, the vetting process of a new vendor or source, uh, the uh, vetting process of the product itself, of uh -huh. looking at all the components, what's being manufactured, what's the source of the raw goods, literally, you know, look at all that. So again, one of the actions from an upper management, I've always suggested that, uh, and again, let's see what your opinion is here, is that from a C-suite, one of the best and first meetings you should have in the new year here is get your purchasing or sourcing executives or management uh, in the room along with your transportation slash logistics along with your compliance and add your it in there mm -hmm. and have them come in and, and and talk through this and say you know let's look at this if you if you haven't done it in the past it's a good time to do it as you're looking through and have objectives set their bonuses are tied to interdependent goals the better the compliance does is the better the purchasing purchasing you can't just look at bigger better faster cheaper you've got to right. look at it holistically and those kinds of things what do you think about that well i was just going to say i think that's smart but i think the other thing that i see often and i bet george does too is a company that really focuses on one part of trade and and kind of puts blinders on to the other areas of risk. So like an aerospace company that focuses on ITAR and export controls, but doesn't really care too much about their customs piece. And, right. and we can guarantee right. you their customs piece has issues. Right. <laughs> so, so I think that's part of it too, is like, it's not just compliance um, of, you know, maybe one area, we have to make sure that we're, as you said, Andy, looking at risk areas holistically and making sure that we're, we're covering those areas appropriately. 
this gets back to our, we used to talk about this a lot and I don't know how much we don't talk about it anymore, yeah. but Adrian, the concept of doing a risk assessment, right. but that risk assessment is so much broader now than it was a few years ago when we were just talking about customs compliance, right? right. Uh, now your risk assessment needs to look at a whole broader range of things. And Andy, your comment was super on point here where you were talking about the purchasing people. Because again, the purchasing people say, why do we have to worry about customs issues or trade issues? Because if you don't know where your product is coming from, if you don't know where it's actually made, you're not going to get it across the border. It's not going to be allowed importation into the United States, no matter what your customs compliance person can do. If you can't overcome that burden, it's going to be excluded. If you can't disprove evasion, it's you're going to get a pen, a massive penalty. So your purchasing people now are really the point people, but you have to train them about that supply chain tracing. That's I think that's the number one takeaway. You know, let's talk about that. That's it. Learning your true supply chain, because once you know that from a customs point of view, you're going to understand what your risks are, where they lie, how you can avoid that risk, how you can diversify your supply chain. And, and one thing that kind of relates to the compliance, I just want to bring up, I'm sorry, I'm throwing one more issue out here. No, uh, this different. is what we want. This is like, because it's like one thing sparks another. I'm like, yeah. I, I, I'm loving this. This is fantastic. Right. Well, I just wanted I just wanted to bring up the fact that we also have the, the new Part 111 uh, I was wondering if any of y'all, because I, the I'm new 111 rules, I have talked to several uh, friends in the brokerage and in the service providers. There are some aspects of that are somewhat alarming. Yes, that's why I want <laughs> to bring, yeah, <laughs> bring up at least the one thing, which is the fact that the broker has to report its clients, uh, right. that it's separation from its client based on if they were trying to use the, the broker as a means to commit fraud um, or make a false statement. Um, and so I well, those are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that I think that is really concerning. And then the other part of it is that the, the broker has to ensure the accuracy of the information that is contained in the right. entry. Mm -hmm. So these two burdens on the broker definitely, I think, kind of shake up that broker client relationship a bit. Um, and, and, and I think that the broker will require a lot more uh, information than they have in the past from the importer so that they don't run afoul of these, these regs. Well, right. especially in, in issuing or rescinding a power of attorney. So let, let, let's stop for just a second. Okay. So for, again, the, our listeners out there and the companies, is, is, most of the power of attorneys are issued for, uh, you know, import purposes to tender entries. You know, so you're going to be the importer of record and they're going to do an entry on your behalf. There's also power of attorneys that are issued regarding for uh, preparing export documentation or any kind of documentation as well as filing for licenses on your behalf and those kinds of things or whatever. If you issue a power of attorney to a customs broker <clears throat> and for some reason on down the road, that customs broker elects to stop doing business with you or mm -hmm. providing services to you because they feel like you or somebody in your company has tried to commit a fraud or fraudulent statement on paperwork and those kinds of things. Aside from a mistake, we're not talking about a mistake. We're talking about an active fraud, fraudulent activity. Not I'm only not sure they, what that is, but we'll, well talk well, about I understand that. that. I understand. That's the I, problem, that's right? The, what the, is what, what, fraudulent it's, versus it, it's like it's, it's something that is uh, nefarious. Let's put it that way. Whatever. Oh, Regardless, okay. I like that, that word. The, the <laughs> customs is expecting the customs broker with this new set of regulations. When we said 111, that's the customs regulations, 111 for brokers. They have to report your company to customs why they are leaving. And that right there 
kind of breaks that client uh, uh, privacy scenario there. And right. th there, there's a lot of issues that are still being debated heavily. So yeah. just so people know what's going on, you got to understand there's some things that maybe you need to get involved from an industry perspective and, uh, and look at this. But if, yeah, if, I think, listen, I, think I hope I, I summarize that kind of, it's a little no, long winded, but I hope you tell me if I've got it well, right again, or wrong. It gets, it, it, uh, it gets back to the issue of many importers say, I'm not an expert in customs right. law. Exactly. I'm hiring a broker. Sure. That broker is an expert. They're going to file that entry for me. And the importer says, broker, I don't know what the tariff classification is. You figure it out. I don't know what the country of origin is. And and brokers simply try their best using the information poor information that they're right. given. They're, they're afraid to ask for more information because they are afraid that the, the importer is going to go somewhere else. Right. So there is a very slippery slope that that everybody is proceeding down uh, towards kind of dumbing down the import process. And just, again, as I said, getting the paperwork across the finish line so you can import the goods without really knowing um, what its tariff classification is, what its value is. Those are all obligations and burdens on the importer, right. no matter how small you are. Right. And one thing that, that I thought was interesting, there was a discussion in the, the Part 111 regs about the fact that, and I think there were some rulings on this too, but I thought it was uh, interesting they reiterated it, which is um, that customs business can, may only be performed in the U.S. How many companies do you know have outsourced, I know you're looking at me, Andy. Um, how I'm, many companies I'm, I'm sitting know? there going, wait a minute, that's a new one on me. I didn't pick up on that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, customs business has to be conducted in the U.S. Um, and so anything, I, you know, we see a lot of companies outsource their classification to an offshore right. company, in India, Hungary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've the heard of all kinds yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. So, and they're not legally allowed to provide any classifications beyond uh, the first six digits. So it is a problem we need to look at people. <laughs> yeah, I will. Well, let me, let me say something on that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, I, I recall now, <laughs> and I remember when there were some discussions on some of this, I think some of that, the intent was from the brokers association where the, some people were pushing some issues on that very thing. And the, and the issue I, that did not come from customs initially that came from the brokers association themselves mm -hmm. from a standpoint, some of their members, let me rephrase it that way from a standpoint, okay. they were trying to protect their industry in a sense saying, you know, look, you know, you can't oh, have sure. somebody off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the, I, I understand yeah. the intent. The problem with that is it's almost like a pendulum swing. It's like, well, now, you, you know, it's. Well, well, I think people just have to keep in mind that, yeah, the regs and the, and some rulings both say, you know, you have to uh, perform customs business in the U.S. and you have to keep the, the customs records in the U.S. Okay. So there is a U.S. centric focus on those two items. Well, customs, you know, has a has an important compliance aspect to that because obviously they can't serve a subpoena. Right. Uh, they can't force someone to testify or to provide evidence mm -hmm. if they're not within the country. Right. And so, you know, that's that's the reason why customs requires documents and, and electronic records to be maintained in the United States, because if there's an enforcement case, they have to get the data from the U S they have to be able to speak to a customs mm -hmm. broker in the U S. Mm -hmm. So right. there's, there's lots of reasons for this rule that, that we may not entirely recognize as a business, as a multilateral, you know, business. Um, we don't think about that sort of thing, but that's why we have those rules. Right. And thank you everyone for, uh, tuning in here for this episode we we are definitely not done with this conversation we we have quite a bit of uh, more that we talked to George Tuttle and uh, Adrian Brown Miller uh, for this episode but I did not want to cut it off and um, 
and just edit it down to the 30 minutes. So what we're doing is that uh, we are splitting this up into two episodes. The next episode will be airing next week and uh, we'll pick up again where we left off here. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.